Welcome. Welcome to this morning, this beautiful fall day, and this opportunity to be together in community. This Unitarian Universalist Fellowship is a place where we come to learn more about being human. We're not here because we figured out all the answers or because we think we've got it right. We come here to learn more about being in relationship together and with the larger world, how to listen, how to forgive, how to be patient, how to adapt and grow, and how to trust and care for those creatures beyond ourselves, both human and non-human. I'm Marianne Trous, and I'm your worship associate this morning. Our minister, the Reverend Ellie Kilpatrick, is out of the pulpit. Our speaker today is Dr. Mike McCullough, who's sitting behind me. Mike McCullough is a professor of psychology at the University of California, San Diego, where he directs the Evolution and Human Behavior Laboratory. He studies the functions of human behavior and emotions using the conceptual tools of evolutionary psychology and cognitive science. He has conducted research on the measurement of forgiveness, empathy, altruism, pro-social life goals, and early life experience. He's the author of three books, the most recent being The Kindness of Strangers, How a Selfish Ape Invented a New Moral Code. Despite all his accomplishment, he still signs his emails to me, Mike. <laughs> a little bird told me Mike plays bass guitar in the post-rock neo-fusion punk jazz band, <laughs> Sweater Weather, <laughs> with three others, including his son, who plays keyboard. You may hear them jamming around town. And last but not least, he's been a guest on one of my very favorite podcasts, on Being, hosted by Krista Tibbet. We're indeed fortunate to have you with us today, Dr. McCullough. Yeah. Your work fits with one of our six sources of UU wisdom and spirituality. It summons us to affirm and promote humanist teachings, which counsel us to heed the guidance of reason and the results of science. It also warns us against idolatries of the mind and spirit. We look forward to hearing you later in the service. Those of you participating via the internet, have your own chalice or candle handy so we can light all our chalices together at the appropriate time. For those of you here, please silence your cell phones. If anyone needs a listening device, just raise your hand and an usher will bring one to you. If you're visiting today, we'd like to get to know you. If you're comfortable, please raise your hand, stand if you wish, and I'll ask each of you to tell us your name and where you're from. Someone will bring you a microphone so that we can hear your names, both virtually and here in the amphitheater. Do we have any visitors? Okay, John is coming down with a mic. I'm uh, Jay Sanders, and this is my wife, Sandy, and we're from uh, Encinitas. Welcome, Jay and Sandy. Okay. I'm Elaine Carter. Uh, I'm Anthony's mother and Daisy's mother-in-law. Uh, I'm a member of the First Unitarian Church of Dallas. Oh, welcome, Elaine. Yeah, your son and daughter-in-law become very active members of our congregation. I'm Misty. I'm from Escondido. Missy? Misty. Misty. Nice to have you from Escondido. I'm Marilyn Tracy, and this is my daughter, Marnie, and I live in Rancho Santa Fe. Marilyn and Marnie, we're glad you're here today. Let's give a warm welcome to our visitors and newcomers. We 
We come together to reaffirm our commitment to this community and to the UU principles that guide us in living a moral and ethical life. We're glad each of you is here today. Let's use a minute or two to say hello to those around you. I'll ring the bell to call you back to your seats. an active congregation with many ways to keep informed, our newsletter, the bulletin board, the weekly order of service announcements, and our website at uufsd.org, where you'll find information about what's happening and the many ways you can become involved. To, describe, to subscribe to our weekly newsletter, email a request to office at uufsd.org. Rev. Ellie, our new minister, has made pastoral care one of her priorities. She and the pastoral care team want to know if you'd like to speak to them about something going on in your life or someone close to you. To reach them, email pastoralcare at uufsd.org and provide your contact information. If you're comfortable saying why you're emailing, it will help someone know how to best contact you. Ravelli has also said you're very welcome to just make an appointment with her on her calendar. And I think the way to get to that is on the website or I think the back of the news, um, our um, order of service also gives that information of how to get onto her calendar. Irv and Liv have asked, they would really appreciate help carrying the donations of clothing. I guess they got overwhelmed with donations of clothing for the refugees. Uh, and they'd love for you to help carry them to the bottom of the stairs, the parking lot after the service. Let's all, visitors, friends, members, old and new, gather on the patio after the service for co coffee and conversation. If you're new, introduce yourself again, so we'll be sure to know who you are and we can chat with you. We begin the service with hymn number 1053 in your teal hymnal. Please stand in body or spirit or body and spirit and join in singing, How Could Anyone?
Thank you, Steve. Did you all notice the birds singing with us? I just love when they do that. <laughs> They're quiet, but then when we sing, they sing. <laughs> As we move into the more spiritual part of our service, let's consider this call to worship adapted from Mark Bellatini. Part as parcel. I am part of you, O oh truth unfolding. I am part of you. I am part of a cosmos. I cannot see either its edge or its end. How amazing. I'm part of a galaxy of a million billion stars. They say it's a pinwheel. How wonderful. I'm part of a system of planets that swing around a parent star. How strong the hands of invisible gravity must be to hold it all together, just so. I'm part of a planet, green and blue, along with mountains and seas, sponges and spores, lichen and lava, robins and rain, periwinkles and perch, centipedes and cities. How great the variety. How astonishing the mutual dependence of it all. I'm part of a species that belongs to a grouping of animals called mammalia. And so is every other human equally so. I'm part of a circle of friends rooted not in ethnicity or food, but in simple redemptive love. And with you, I am part and parcel of this moment. This simple silence, which lasts but a few breaths, and then is gone forever. But it is precious, a present for which I give thanks. UUFSD resides on the lands of the Kumeyaay and Luthanyo peoples who have lived here since time immemorial. They've understood themselves as belonging to the land. Many indigenous people still thrive in this place, alive and strong. As indigenous artist Johnny Bear Contreras, a member of the San Pasquale of Mission Indians recently said, we want to be recognized as a contemporary people who are always growing and learning, not just stuck between the pages of history. We at UUFSD express deep gratitude for the ongoing indigenous contributions to our greater community. May we who are relative newcomers also come to see that we too belong to the land and still have much to learn from it and its indigenous peoples. We're going to light the chalice now, and I want to invite Mike McCullough to come up and light it for us. Thank you. The Unitarian Universalist Flaming Chalice represents our shared history, hope, and commitment to the principles of faith that hold us together. Those of you at home are now invited to join us in lighting a chalice or candle, holding it up to your camera so we can share our light together. In the words of Brian Swim, humans enter this world and awaken to a simple truth. We must find our story within this great epic of being. May our glowing flame represent 
this journey. Please rise, embody your spirit, and join in singing our centering hymn, Spirit of Life, followed by reciting our covenant. The words to both are in your order of service. May love be the spirit of this congregation. May the quest for truth be its sacrament and service be its prayer. To dwell together in peace, to seek knowledge in freedom, and to help one another in fellowship. This is our covenant. You may be seated. As you may have noticed, the worship committee is attempting to make joys and sorrows more accessible. Today, we'll share our joys and sorrows before the children leave for class. And I think I see no children. <laughs> but anyway, we're going to try this change. Maybe there are and I don't see. Sorry about that. Uh, that way, you children will have a chance to tell us something if something important has happened to you this week, especially if it made you very happy or sad. We express our feelings and experiences among our friends here so we can get to know each other better and help each other. If any of you, children or adults, wishes to do so, please come to the front and let us know what has moved you deeply. And a couple other directions today. If you want to speak from your seat, just raise your hand and a mic will be brought to you. Uh, if you're at home, write your joy or sorrow in the chat and Joe will read it afterwards. Let's honor this time to share our personal experiences rather than to give announcements. If you prefer to express your joy or sorrow silently, you may drop a stone into the bowl at the side of the chancel over there now or any time during the service. Please come forward to speak. Well, I have a joy. Um, my middle grandson just finished um, got through hell week this week um he's training to be a navy seal and so i'm very proud of him and i'm kind of anxious for my youngest grandson who's just started college at uh, santa barbara and i'm hoping that he will not get kicked out 
I have a joy to share for Charlotte Alm. I've visited with her this week and I know that many of you have expressed concerns. She's greatly appreciative of the emails and the cards that are coming her way. I know that some of you have expressed a desire to see what else you could do. And for now, she really just wants to have some quiet time. She's a very spiritual woman, is doing a lot of reading and um, both you'll see information coming from the pastoral care and if you'd like to get in touch with me personally feel free to do that but um, again the cards and the emails are greatly appreciated hi i'm richard mcdonald um i don't know if this is a joy or a sorrow or just a story but my family all live now on Vancouver Island and the oldest of my generation, uh, my brother-in-law is in, in and out of uh, um, uh, care, what do you call it? Um, uh, what do you call it? Yeah, in and out of hospice. So I, I talked with him the other day and sent him some emails and I, I looked up and found out that there's a UU congregation in Nanaimo, British Columbia, where they live. And so I said, oh, you know, I'm involved with this church. And so he got to go out on a trip uh, of drive with his daughters. <clears throat> and he said, Dick, I drove by your church and it's in the same building as a mortuary. <laughs> <laughs> so we had a good laugh and a cry on that whole topic. And I just, uh, that's kind of my family, and I wanted to share that. <laughs> Maybe every of you should be connected to a mortuary. <laughs> anyway, thank you. Joe, were there any joys or sorrows expressed in the chat? Oh, I'm sorry. No. Did I miss one? OK. Herbs and my joy today is just the awareness of the generosity of this community. We received an overwhelming amount of warm clothing and blankets and so on for the refugees at our borders, which we will be delivering today. We had to get a truck actually to bring them down. We thought we would just have a car full, but now we have a, more than a truck full. So thank you so much. It's a joy to receive your generosity. Any others here? Joe, I didn't hear if you received any. There are not. Thank you. For all those joys or and sorrows, spoken and sp unspoken, held within our hearts, we hope the joys are amplified and the sorrows are diminished. Let there be an offering to sustain and to strengthen this community, which is sacred to so many of us. Please give an amount that fills you with the pleasure of sharing what you can. I think I missed our intergenerational sharing. Uh, Cheryl, will you come forward? I guess I'm not used to this new order either. All right, good morning, everyone. 
I'm going to read a book today called Can We Be Friends? And it's an unexpected animal friendships from around the world. And it's by Erica Sorotich. <clears throat> Can we be friends with someone who is very different and not like us at all? Let's see. Now we've got two different animals here, a tortoise and a hippo, and they're gonna describe each other, to describe themselves. My shell is my house. I'm a hundred or more. I like the calm, quiet hush of the forest floor. Mm -hmm. And over here, I'm big all around, but I'm still a calf. I make a loud, rowdy ruckus when I take a bath. Can we be friends? Yes, please. After a tidal wave hit Kenya, Africa, baby hippo Owen couldn't find his family. But soon he was rescued and moved to a nearby forest sanctuary. There, a very old giant tortoise named Mzi became his friend. The two foraged and ate together, waded in the water together, and napped in the sun together. Like a true friend, Mzi helped Owen grow into a big, strong, happy hippopotamus. In fact, within a few years, Owen grew to be much larger than his tortoise Companion. Oops. Okay. <clears throat> this one is about a gorilla and some kittens. It's almost bedtime, so I build a nest. I sign, sleep now, Coco, settle down and rest. And over here, oh, it's dark outside now. We find a warm spot. We snore, snuggle, purr, wake up, spar, and swat. Can we be friends? Certainly. Coco, the gorilla, was born in a California zoo. Her caretaker, Penny, knew gorillas were very smart. Penny brought Coco to live with her at a research center called the Gorilla Foundation. She taught Coco sign language so she could understand her better. Using her signs, Coco asked Penny for a kitten. Over the years, Coco adopted several kitten friends. At bedtime, Coco built herself a comfy nest out of blankets, towels, and other soft things. Kittens can sleep anywhere, but Coco's kittens love to join her for a nap in her nest. Whose friend will you be? The end. Thank you, Cheryl. How about if we do the offering now? And I think the uh, choir will come up to do a special piece afterwards. Oh, you did the offering. Wow. That was quick. <laughs> I guess it's time for our special music. Uh, Steve Malloy will lead them in singing a, sa a shaker song called Special Gifts, adapted by Aaron Copeland and arranged by Dave Bruner.
Thank you. That was lovely. Let's connect in silence for meditation, reflection, or prayer by first singing the chant, Meditation on Breathing, <coughs> which I hope the choir will start. The time will end with the sound of the bell. Um, and after that, we'll invite Dr. Mike McCullough up to speak to us on happy, healthy, and wealthy how gratitude changes us and our relationships. Morning. I'm glad to be with you this morning. Uh, it's a real privilege and honor to join you on such a beautiful morning. Um, I want to thank you, Marianne, for the invitation, and to my friend um, Don McLeod for um, helping to pick me out as somebody that he thought might be worth listening to. So 
Uh, I'm going to try to make good on that over the next uh, 20 minutes or so. 20 minutes is a, a pretty tall order for a university professor. Um, we're used to speaking, well, really, as long as there's someone there to listen or uh, have, a, have a lecture thrust upon them. Uh, my poor family gets that all too often, uh, but it's your turn. Higher education is the only uh, consumer good uh, that the less of it you give, the consumer is happier. Um, I am going to try to give something that's worth at least 20 minutes of your time this morning. If you ever go to Dallas, Texas, uh, where I used to live for about two years, um, uh, tourists always want to go to one place above all others. And that's Dealey Plaza, right? Someone here from, right? That's the place, at least when we lived there, I taught at Southern Methodist University for a couple of years. That's where our guests always wanted to go. Of course, Dealey Plaza is where the Grassy Knoll is, um, where uh, kind of uh, uh, John F. Kennedy um, made history, although he certainly was not looking to make history in that particular way. Um, but you don't have to walk far from Dealey Plaza to get to a lesser known place called Thanksgiving Square. Thanksgiving Square was uh, founded by a philanthropist, famous Dallas uh, philanthropist and businessman uh, named Peter Stewart. Uh, it has a beautiful uh, spire there um, called Thanksgiving Tower. Uh, it was designed by the famous uh, postmodern architect Philip Johnson. Uh, I highly recommend it if you're up for a 15 minute walk from uh, Dealey Plaza to have a look. Um, one of the things that makes Thanksgiving Square special uh, is not just the tower, but it's also Thanksgiving Hall. Uh, Peter Stewart had a mission, which was to bring the concept of Thanksgiving and the concept of gratitude to every country in the world. Uh, he worked with the UN for years to establish a World Day of Thanksgiving and to get Thanksgiving on uh, a postage stamp. Uh, sponsored by the United Nations. And I think ultimately he was successful with that. I got to know Peter Stewart uh, because in the year 2000, he asked uh, me and a colleague of mine, Bob Emmons, to come to a, a conference on gratitude at Thanksgiving Square. Uh, and this was the first time uh, ever that a scientific conference on gratitude uh, had ever been convened. It should have been a very short conference uh, because at that time there was very, very little known about the, the emotion, uh, the sentiment of gratitude. Um, it's what we called uh, at the time the neglected emotion. Um, I could have called this this talk today the uh, uh, gratitude, the neglected emotion, because what I really want to tell you about is what we have learned over uh, the past 23 years about gratitude. Um, where it comes from, what it's supposed to do for us, and how it affects uh, our emotions and our relationships. Prior to 2000, uh, the number of scientific articles on gratitude uh, numbered in uh, just the, the low double digits. Uh, this morning I found 41 before 2000. Between 2000 and now, there are more than 1,200 uh, scholarly articles about gratitude. It's a topic that uh, has exploded in interest, and it, I, I think it's fair to say it's no longer so neglected as an emotion. When I got interested in gratitude, uh, one of the first things I wondered about, uh, being a, a researcher interested in emotions, and uh, in particular interested in um, applying uh, Darwinian uh, natural selection theory to everything about human nature, including our emotions, is what's it for? Why do we have this capacity to experience gratitude? Why is it something that we uh, encourage our, children's, our children to experience and express? Um, why does it feel, in some cases, so good to experience it? Um, what does it do? Um, if it's in there, for, uh, if it's in there um, well, a good uh, Darwinian would tell you it's probably there for a reason, for a function. So I started to work with uh, this collaborator of mine, Robert Emmons, who's uh, just retired from UC uh, Davis, to try to describe what we thought were the three functions gratitude has in our lives. 
we started straight off to think about gratitude as having largely a moral function. Emotions have all kinds of functions. Some of us make, uh, some of us are designed to um, uh, respond when positive things happen to us um, so that we'll um, savor them and enjoy them uh, and be attracted to them in the future. Uh, emotions like anxiety are designed to keep us away from things that might harm us. Uh, anger has the function of uh, causing us to uh, move out toward our interpersonal relationships, to cause people to value us more than we think they currently are. Guilt is designed to cause us to repair relationships when we've damaged relationships through some kind of transgression. Grief is designed to help us learn after a loved one has died. We can go on and on about the emotions and their functions, but the function of gratitude was just really not very theorized. Uh, as we began to look into the research at the time, uh, what we knew and what we knew from evolutionary theory. We wondered if gratitude's large, large function wasn't to register morality, particularly uh, others' positive treatment of us when we weren't otherwise expecting positive treatment from them. So we called gratitude an, a moral emotion. Gratitude, as we came to think about it and dis uh, describe it in our own research, we saw as having sort of three functions in our sort of in the sort of moral grammar of our social lives. The first is that it serves the function of uh, being a moral barometer. We think one of the things it does, it's designed to act like a thermostat, if you, rather a, a, a thermometer, if you like, or a barometer, even, you know, more conveniently, that tells us when someone is treating us better than we thought we deserved from that particular person. We walk around in life, people are doing nice things for us all the time. Uh, friends are doing nice things for us, spouses, uh, colleagues, uh, acquaintances. But over time, we get used to these uh, nice things that people do for us, these kindnesses, these favors, uh, these obligations that they fulfill. Emotions aren't designed to register everything that's the same, that everything is, you know, they, they don't exist to tell you, tell you that nothing has changed. It's the opposite. Emotions tell you that something important has changed. So gratitude doesn't really respond when you're just getting the same treatment you've always expected from somebody. Gratitude, the dial on gratitude moves when someone has done something for you that you weren't expecting, given what you thought that relationship was all about. So it's designed to regis register surprises, surprised kind, surprising kindnesses, uh, favors from friends that you were, or acquaintances that you, that you weren't expecting. A favor of kind of a given magnitude, something kind someone does for you, means a lot more when it comes from someone who evidently values you more than you thought they did. So a ride from the ride to the airport can mean a lot more from someone that you've really just begun to gotten to know, to get to know than someone you've you've known a long time. It registers benefits that were intentionally given, uh, that were that are particularly of value to you, that were costly to give and that were given with the intention of making you better off. So it's designed to track the, uh, I believe, the genesis of friendship, uh, the recognition that someone values you more than you'd otherwise thought, which leads to, I think, what its second function is, which is um, to work as a moral motive. When someone has treated you better than you were expecting, that's the kind of person you wanna have around you we all want friends. We all want people who care about us. We all want people who love us. So when we see signs that they have actually treated us in that way, um, one of the best ways to be a friend of, to, to uh, acquire friends who value you is to show that you value them. And um, so by serving as a moral motive, the recognition of uh, others care for us that we feel is gratitude motivates us to turn around instead and to try to care for them. And you get, as a result, kind of a runaway dynamic. You make, someone makes you better off in ways that communicate to you that they care about you and why this causes you to behave in a reciprocal fashion, which in turn affirms for them that you're somebody who cares about them more than they believe. And this is how we build friendships over time. And we move from 
acquaintances, acquaintances, strangers to acquaintances, to friends, to dear friends. The final function of gratitude, we believe, uh, believed and still believe, and I think the research supports, is to serve as a moral reinforcer. Uh, when you thank people, it uh, is a way of acknowledging the benefits they've provided. And there's nothing like a benefit requited to um, spur along people's desire to provide those benefits in the future. Um, as uh, the Stoic Cicero said, gratitude is uh, not only the fairest of virtues, but in fact, the parent of all the others. And I think that's right on the money. And I think the research uh, demonstrates that resoundingly now uh, that we've got our 1,281 uh, scholarly articles on it. Gratitude uh, builds relationships. And we now know, uh, again, resoundingly, that psychological well-being is utterly dependent on relational well-being. Um, in fact, um, one of the major findings from all areas of the social sciences is that relationships confer uh, innumerable, innumerable benefits, not only for psychological well-being, but for physical well-being as well. Um, we have to have social support. We have to have cooperative partners. We have to have people that care about us in order to have a fully formed uh, functional human life. Um, humans, uh, Homo sapiens are unique, um, not uniquely unique, but certainly unique in our utter dependence on well-functioning relationships to make a living in life. You don't become a, uh, a, uh, an adult human being um, that's going to go on to have offspring of your own and uh, a community uh, and meaning if you don't have relationship partners to do the work of getting through life with. Uh, we evolved to live in communities in the network of friendships and families. Um, and as a result, positive relationships are good for mental health, physical health, longevity, keeps your refrigerator from breaking down, all kinds of things. Good things come from, from uh, having, being in a network of positive relationships. Gratitude is one of those things that makes us uh, renews our sense that our relationships are positive and flourishing. It helps us to recall those benefits from the past that otherwise we might have kind of gotten inured to. Um, uh, emotions don't respond to everything being the same. They respond to things being different. So one of the things that's hard to do, I think, because gratitude has to be renewed, gratitude responds to change like all emotions, is what do you do in a sea of sameness because most of us walk around not building new relationships every day uh, not acquiring new, new new information that someone values us more than we thought instead and this is the case for people around the world everywhere we live in worlds where the relationships are stable and don't really change so much so how do you keep gratitude fresh and renewed and keep that sense of wonder or the benefits that you have, um, that sense of appreciation, kind of that ability to savor um, the blessings of uh, being a sentient human being um, on this little marble of a world. Well, one of the things that uh, Bob and I started doing early on was uh, pretty simple-minded, actually. We wondered if you could uh, help people kind of renew their sense of gratitude on a daily basis just by, um, and this is actually highly technical research. Um, we spent lots and lots of time uh, developing um, the technology to make this happen. We had people uh, write diaries uh, on a piece of paper where they wrote down three things they were grateful for every day. Uh, we did this with undergraduate students. Um, we did this with people, regular folks living in the community. And we did it with a sample of people uh, with chronic neuromuscular disorders. And it was really simple. Write down three things a day you're grateful for. Some people did it for every day for 14 days. Some people did it once a week for 10 weeks. Others did it uh, um, uh, once, uh, once a week uh, for 14 weeks. 
Uh, as we went along, we asked them to measure their daily experiences of happiness and sadness and negative emotions. We kept records of uh, uh, how well they were sleeping, how much sleep they were getting, how much exercise they were doing. And in study after study, we found that simply asking people to keep track of their blessings, really counting your blessings every day, thinking about people you appreciated, thinking about a positive events that had occurred for which you were grateful, um, was enough to get this big boost in psychological well-being. People said they were exercising more. Um, they felt like they were getting better sleep quality. They were sleeping more hours. Um, they reported less days of feeling unwell. Um, and this led us to really think that there is something special about taking a moment, uh, just a throwaway moment, just a few minutes, a couple of minutes, once a day, to take in those benefits that otherwise you would have kind of gotten satiated by and inured to and otherwise would have taken for granted. Um, Fast forward sort of 20 years from when we began to do that work and kind of the technology, the gratitude uh, inducing technology that now are uh, in scientists hands and now are available to put into your hands as well. Um, include things like writing a gratitude letter. Um, one of the more potent things you can do to experience that sense of gratitude for what you've you've been given is. Not to just write sort of in this disembodied way about things you're grateful for or people you're grateful to, but to write a letter to somebody who has done something for you that was extraordinary that maybe you've never thanked or that you've really perhaps not even for your own benefit taken the time to unwind to think about why it feels like it was so extraordinary the changes that it made for you the costs that the person had to uh, um, uh, absorb in order to do that that benefit for you um, and to write this letter it could be a letter you just keep for yourself it could be a letter that you pop in the mail uh, and send um, this is a one-time thing um, that um, uh, the psychologist martin seligman at the university of pennsylvania started working on um, 20 years ago or maybe a little less um, he found that people who uh, um, wrote these gratitude letters, ended up uh, feeling the same way that we seem to uh, discover um, when writing these, uh, when keeping track of these daily diaries for a number, of, a number of weeks. The final thing you can do, you can take control of for yourself, is to write a, um, is to make a, pay a gratitude visit. Can you think of somebody in your life who, did something for you so meaningful and so powerful that maybe they don't even know how touched you in the way that it did. Um, are they are open to a phone call? Is it someone you can go visit? Is it someone you can write that letter to? Uh, is it someone whose door you can go knock on that you can zoom with? Um, a gratitude visit of that sort um, um, is not only um, extraordinarily powerful for the person making that visit, as you might imagine, but um, it's also a powerful technology for um, the person being thanked. These are things we don't do very often in daily life. We have to cultivate these kind of practices. I don't suppose you really need to sit down with a pen and paper to uh, count your blessings every day. Um, it's something you could do in your own mind or inter interior of your soul, I suppose, but you know, the practice of getting it down on paper helps. Some days you'll find that what you're really grateful to is the Rolling Stones or um, that you found a parking spot, but other days you might uncover other things that are uh, maybe, even, maybe even more meaningful than, than um, brown sugar or she's a rainbow. We are uh, undergoing, uh, taking, uh, starting out on a program of research to understand gratitude around the world. Peter Stewart wanted Thanksgiving to be understood in every home and heartland around the world. But the truth is at this point, we really truly don't know within social science how universal an emotion of gratitude really is. We think of these things as being kind of universals, you know, of human emotional experience. But the truth is scientists don't really know if that's the case I and mean, there's good reasons to think it's the case but uh we don't know 
We also don't know whether these gratitude interventions help everybody around the same around the world in the same way. So I've started working with a team of other psychologists and social scientists to um, engage in a program of research that we hope will involve ultimately um, scientists and laboratories from over 50 countries around the world, where we're going to try to understand as a pure sort of matter of science, whether there is an emotion of gratitude that people experience and that they can make sense of and they have a language for, um, it kind of fits a way we understand it fitting into their kind of emotional grammar around the world and every society. Um, I kind of think we will. I think probably Peter Stewart was right about that, but maybe not. And, you know, as good scientists, we need to keep our uh, options open. If we find that gratitude doesn't exist everywhere, well, we need to um, try to understand that as well and, and try to make sense of that. We're also going to be working to see whether these count your blessings interventions are beneficial everywhere. The ways we might think of them as being useful in, in the United States or in North America may just not make any sense in other parts of the world where there are more culturally appropriate ways of kind of helping people to experience gratitude. So gratitude is, uh, I think, neglected no longer. Uh, it's an emotion we've come to understand quite a lot about. Um, it is, uh, I think, no more, no less neglected uh, in science uh, as it is in um, the grammar of our own uh, daily lives and, and lives as humans that are interconnected and interdependent as we go from uh, the womb to the tomb, as it were. Um, as you approach Thanksgiving, uh, I hope maybe this is some food for thought that might be useful as you uh, gather around a table or around a computer to uh, have a Zoom Thanksgiving with, with uh, people you care about. Um, thanks for your time. I wish you well. I very much appreciate the chance to talk with you today. Thank you. Thank you, Professor McCullough. Do you know, I think gratitude is one of the cornerstones of our faith and our thinking about things. So it's interesting for me, I hadn't really thought of the moral connection, but thank you. As we move toward the closing of our service, let us invoke the spirit, insights, and ideals of this morning service by singing the hymn number 128, For All That Is Our Life. Please rise in body or spirit. The words are in your gray hymnal. For all that is alive, we sing our thanks and praise. For all that is a gift, which we are called to use to build a common good and make our own days glad. For needs which others serve, for services we
You may be seated. After we extinguish the chalice, Dr. McCullough and I will be at the greeting desk that you passed as you entered. Would love to hear your comments if you wish to stop. Then join together on the patio for coffee, for the coffee hour with the community. Now we invite you to join in saying the words to extinguish our chalice, then stay to enjoy the postlude played by Lynn Towie. Thank you, Lynn. We extinguish this chat, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of community. These we carry in our hearts until we are together again. Thank you. 